the Austro-Hungarian Empire was, was still in its heyday. I think it was during his lifetime that the, the double, uh, double monarchy, as whatever it was called, was set up. So uh, uh, in Budapest, in the twin capitals, Budapest and Vienna, with Emperor Franz Joseph being you know, the, the, in, in charge of the, the whole thing. Germany was already consolidated as, as, a, as an empire. By, the, by his lifetime, there was a unified culture, you know, a German culture that had arisen uh, in the previous century or so, uh, with with German as a literary language and with a, just, of course, rich heritage of, of music that he could uh, draw upon. It was also a period where Jews were f being first uh, allowed to own property and do participate in the general culture of the region in ways that had been uh, pretty much prohibited earlier on. That allowed him access to the world, but, he, but to get to post in Vienna he had to convert. There was no way they were going to have a non-Catholic conducting the, the Vienna Opera. It was just couldn't happen in those days. So, so that's part of, the, part of the story too. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think I've read, I think I've got this straight, that well, he was born in a, in a very small village in, in Moravia, this part of the eastern part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the time, uh, and then moved to this slightly, well, quite a bit bigger town. Iglau was the name of the town. And the move was because his father was able to buy property in the bigger town because of a new edict that allowed. So, so he's living in the middle, living in the middle of these changes in, in, in law that allows allows him to get access to the kind of education and ex life experiences that allow him to get a foot in the in, in the door. And a generation earlier, it wouldn't have happened. He wouldn't. Have, he, he couldn't have become the Gustav Mahler that we, that we know. You know. So he comes into mature, well, he was born in 1860, and he, his first really important pieces are the Songs of a Wayfarer, uh, 1883, so he's 23. So the, the, the composer of composers, there are many, many voices that feed into Mahler's voice, but I think the composer above all who uh, sets the agenda, at least for young Mahler in, in certain ways, is Wagner, Richard Wagner. Uh, so that late chromatic tonality of Wagner. Now what's interesting in, in, in Mahler is that although he was absorbed uh, by uh, Wagner's music, the chromatic side of it, these kinds of rich, complex harmonies that Wagner fostered uh, toward, especially in his late works, that's not really what we associate with Mahler. He's got, a, a, in a sense, a more simple palette, uh, but the grandioseness of, of the music, the, the huge sweeping effects of the music that that he does take on, at least in some of his some of his music. Mahler comes at the very end of of what we call the Romantic period, and this is a period that was especially influenced by Austrian and German composers and. Mahler is trying to express nothing less than he f was famously quoted as saying, the entire world. There was a very famous meeting between this Finnish composer, Jean Sibelius, and Mahler. And each of them was discussing their philosophy about what the symphony should be. And for Sibelius, it was very much a form uh, into which composers pour their notes. And so it was very much more scientific for Sibelius, I think. For Mahler, it was nothing less than, I want to express the entire world. And the highs and the lows and nature and love and the coming of spring and a funeral march. And, you know, he pulls out all the stops, especially with this third symphony, as far as the size of the orchestra, the special effects, the dances, the psychological baggage that, that a post horn brings, an offstage post horn that young children's voices bring, that a, that a fantastic intimate song brings. He really covers the gamut of things. And this is what makes it, I think, a great challenge for the performers because you are soaring at the highest highs and also plumbing the lowest depths. 
the dynamic range is from the loudest to the very softest possible. And so these kind of extremes are typical of Mahler, but also make it a, a real challenge. Mahler is saying the same thing. It, it's his voice, and that's not to say for a moment that it's all the same. It's just to say that his voice is there, and it's so indelibly there in everything that he creates. Um, he, he strikes me as someone who's always seeking and who's never complacent. Um, this is, for me, exactly what drives it. It's why I also feel that he's so compelled to go to the core of the deepest, maybe even most painful questions. And for him, those tend to be uh, life and death, as in the end they are for all of us. So you find that in, in his songs as well. Um, even on those lighter pieces, I think of things like um, Ich atme eine linden Duft is a small song um, that seemingly is just about um, smelling the blossom of a linden tree. But he uses the linden tree, and the linden tree of course is employed in a lot of uh, German romantic poetry, and, but in Mahler's own poetry, he was sometimes writing his own text, um, is always this symbol of rest and peace and this fine line between life and death. So even in something, in a very light song with a very, um, um, with single lines of piano that are against the voice and a really simple harmony and really, really simple counterpoint, still has the notion of something underlying that's profound and sometimes melancholy. That's, those are, those are things that Mahler seems to always assert in almost anything he's creating. The early material tends to be the songs, all these songs. Uh, there are some that he wrote his own text for uh, and others that he drew upon various collections of poetry. Uh, Des Knaben Wunderhorn is the one that he drew most extensively from Youth's Magic Horn is how it's normally translated. It's a collection of folk poetry that uh, was published in the early 19th century and that Mahler was ex exceedingly fond of and drew you know, many of his poems, uh, many of the texts that he said were, were taken from that. What he did then later on in the early symphonies is to integrate either whole cloth songs that were then blown up into orchestral versions or take the song, the melodies from his songs leave out the words and use them as themes in his music. So when he does that, he does that in the first symphony very extensively, to know the songs that are the basis of the, these melodies, themes that you're hearing, gives you a very wonderful insight into what he's thinking of as a, as a composer as he composes out this orchestral music. So in, the, in all the early symphonies, there's this going back and forth with, uh, with these, with these texts, many of which, like I said, he said when he was even younger. Uh, later that becomes less pronounced. That's really not part of his, of, of his uh, late style. But in the Third Symphony in particular, one of the movements is one of these Knaben von der Horn uh, poems. The difference, one of the things that fascinates me about M Mahler, many things do, is how early in his life he found his, his voice as a composer. And what I mean by that is what makes him distinctive, what makes him sound really like nobody else. There's a piece that he wrote, uh, I think it was only 19, called Das Klagen der Lied, uh, the, the Song of Sorrow, uh, that doesn't have the richness, the depth, the uh, sure-handedness of later Mahler, but when you hear it, it doesn't sound like anybody else. It sounds, wow, that's Mahler already. To me, that's kind of amazing at that you know, relatively young age to have uh, a well-defined uh, musical voice. Uh, Bruno Walter, great conductor who studied with Mahler, worked with Mahler, and one of the really important, really champions of Mahler's music. And he talks about this aspect of Mahler and he contrasts Mahler with Bruckner. Back in those days, a lot of people were making this Mahler. You don't, you don't hear this so much anymore, but this Bruckner-Mahler connection. And, and what Bruno Walter says, I think it's right on the money. I mean, he's really insightful here. He says, in Bruckner, Bruckner was a Roman Catholic. He was an organist and uh, secure in his faith. And with Bruckner, you get 
just that, this absolutely secure faith of a, of a confirmed, well, in this case, Roman Catholic. It could be any religion, but, you know. And he said, but in Mahler, what you get is the struggle. He wants to believe, but he can't quite believe, and, and, and it's never, never settled. And it, to me, uh, I've always carried that with me, uh, that, that inside of Don Walters, I think he's, it, it's been verified for me a time and time and again as I've studied you know, the biography and I've studied the music. So, like I keep saying over and over, it's a very interesting aspect of who Mahler was. I talked earlier about the, the symphony like a novel that can contain a, a kind of a whole world kind of, kind of business. This is a story uh, about when he was leaving for New York. So he was catching the train in Vienna to catch, to go to Hamburg and catch a boat. To New York. Uh, and Arnold Schoenberg, I've mentioned several times earlier, along with his two most important students, great composers in their own rights, Anton Weber and, and Alban Berg, they, those three were seeing Mahler off at the train station. And the story goes that uh, Mahler asked one of them, and it slips my mind which one, it wasn't Schoenberg, it was one of the other two. Uh, he asked one of them uh, if they've read Dostoevsky, who I guess had been translated into German by then. And uh, the response was a kind of sheepish no. <laughs> uh, and Mahler shakes his finger, kind of thing. He says, this is more important than studying counterpoint. <laughs> now we know that he studied his counterpoint too, and he's, you know, his musical craft is exquisite, you know, very tremendous uh, grasp of musical craft, uh, otherwise he couldn't be the composer he was. But it tells you something. It, 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 in Dostoevsky, it's just of the psychology of the inner life of, of man, you know, that, that is captured so profoundly, so vividly. And so the composer as psychologist or the composer as portraying psychological states clearly was really important to Mahler, as well as this, the novelist's big perspective where you could, you know, have a, a long story unfold. Again, it's, it's, it's a philosophy that this kind of s summed up by Mahler and his symphonies that was later eschewed by composers like Stravinsky, who came only 15 or 20 years later. But as the world changed, as World War I came, then art changed. And so this is really kind of a summing up of the great Germanic and Austrian tradition of romantic music and, again, the symphony trying to express everything possible in the world. Mahler is one of the greatest orchestrators in the history of music. His command of the orchestra, his use of the orchestra is truly extraordinary. And one of the things that we love about Mahler's orchestration is the amazing lucidity, how he can have many, many things going on simultaneously, but each thing comes across with clarity. Uh, it's that masterful handling of balances in the orchestra. It's just quite extraordinary. And it's also he has this ability to pare down. So we'll be writing for an orchestra of 100, but he's not, he's not unhappy to write some important passage where you're only using four, five, six people because that's what he needs right there. And he'll go on for a while. And then, and then when they, you know, so, so he, he uses that full range of everything at his disposal with this incredible lucidity. And I think that in very different composers with you know different kinds of aesthetics and different kinds of uh, surface qualities to the music is something that many many composers have turned to Mahler for you know how do I handle a huge orchestra and how do I make it lucid clear how can I move back and forth you know these, these so from a huge mass and you know what I mean a lot of people to a, a, almost like a chamber thing, seamlessly, you know, and everything in between. Uh, that's that mo that moves us way outside of Mahler to a whole m m you know, many many different composers with many many different kinds of aesthetics. But I think you know it's something there. It's like here's some textbooks you can go study these nine symphonies by Mahler and Dusley from it and some of the other songs that can teach you. You want to learn how to manage these forces. Here, here's, here's, here's what you can turn to. 
his last principal engagement was in New York. Uh, you know, where he did the Metropolitan Opera and also the, the symphony, he did both. And um, wildly successful, you know, really successful tour. By that time, his heart condition that killed him uh, was getting severe. And I can't remember if, the, if, the, if he made it through his whole contract or if it had to be terminated earlier, but in any case, when he left to return to Vienna, it was the last trip that he would make because he was deathly ill already and he died shortly after, shortly after returning.